Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So uh, we are uh, looking at uh, various kinds of examples. Uh, we looked at uh, uh, the orchestration in SMEs. Uh, so where we have saw that uh, uh, there is the interaction with various participants in the supply chain, and uh, uh, how this uh, this helps. Uh, let us look at the logistics uh, this one. So that is what is called B2B logistics chain. So what is B2B logistics? It is business to business uh, logistics. Logistics network with several companies coming together to offer service delivery. In other words, there are several suppliers and the suppliers uh, basically have to transfer or to have to supply to some manufacturer and uh, so and uh, not only one supplier but the several suppliers and also this each supplier may supply to several manufacturers same component. So there is a, mm, a multiple uh, this one and they are all modular with modular organization structure. In other words if you look at the logistics chain there are the warehouses they may be owned by somebody else and the ownership is, is different and there are truck companies they may be owned by a Ford or Toyota or whatever. They could be they could be different uh, uh, owners. And similarly, the other things. So other services that are needed are all uh, owned by different people. So they are all modular with modular organization structure. The service network is formed for each order for the collection of two PLs or three PLs. Supposing somebody wants to transfer one company auto company wants to transfer uh, some components from somewhere in the United States to Detroit where this is done or from in India from say Pune to uh, uh, to Gurgaon in uh, near Delhi. So this what is that at that time you know there is no fixed uh, players in this. So you try to you have a collection of people and from that collection you select the the truck drivers you select the warehouse places you select uh, select the trucks and uh, and so on and basically you form a network for each of these orders and each delivery is monitored for quality time and damage etc and planning of the resources and their maintenance is done by a coordinator called the 4PL 4PL is four party logistics for players he is basically uh, he is asset free. In other words, he is like an orchestrator. He does not own any assets, but he just manages. He is responsible for the delivery, but uh, he does not own any assets. So, if you the execution of each delivery is monitored. So, if you look at uh, uh, B2B logistics redesign using cloud. If you look at uh, the diagram say, there is a seller, there is a buyer. And this is the chain of events that usually happen for an international logistics chain. You put it, them in a warehouse and afterwards they are forwarded by uh, from the warehouse uh, for the customs clearance and they go through either airline shipping, this is the international travel and there is custom clearance at the other end, that the freight forwarding and then to the warehouse and of the buyer. So from warehouse to warehouse, there are a chain of players that are there. Now here, there are several of these players. Now what is their information systems? How are they connected? You can have each of them have their own information systems. And they are all connected by a communication network. But they may be, in other words, for example, uh, this warehouse may be using uh, Manhattan Associates warehouse. This can be Oracle, Oracle this one and 
the the airline shippers may not be using the customs clearance may be using some other software and all that what happens in that particular case is that the information systems either they can communicate but there is interfaces become some difficult so what you could do if you want to have an orchestrator on this you can have a cloud network which is connecting all these so you can reconstruct all this and it is already happening nowadays there are companies which are doing in other words trying to put everything on cloud have all the data on this I put all the players on this cloud and you can have e capacity inventory visibility in all this so using cloud and big data you could do a lot of machine learning your machine learning algorithms like you could do a lot of analysis that happens in this one of the things that you could do usually supposing you are sending some the seller is sending something to uh, a buyer somewhere and if he is doing it frequently then it's not to go not necessarily to go through go through the uh, 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 the optimization route to find what is the best route who are the players and all that you have all the data here so you can mine that data and find out what is the best route who are the best players and if you if you have to hire two or three uh, players across this i mean some people in this some people in this uh, uh, leg then what are the kinds of what is the relationship between the players and this so that they collaborate and your job is done in a more uh, uh, cooperative way rather than uh, you know if they don't know each other then there could be problems of this so here a collaborative network can be formed with all the data using using the cloud and the others this one so the b2b chain can be used used using cloud and big data you can orchestrate on this now that is about the b2b logistics chain now let's look at uh, uh, another logistics chain which is uh, that happens in emerging markets like in india now the logistics industry uh, Uh, you basically it moved from a function of uh, under the procurement or sales uh, management to end to end goods movement to modular clusters or stacks populated by specialist firms and infrastructure authorities so the industry stack divides activities into layers that are complementary to each other as depicted in the figure but well, i'll show you that figure yes so what is the logis what does logistics mean what is what is the logistics this one let us do look at the figure and I'll come back to this slide now if you look at this figure there is the infrastructure players which are ports airports rail road freight right freight logistics hub free trade zones and all that the second uh, uh, players in this are carriers like ships aircraft wagons trucks cranes moving equipment and so on now these two are the asset incentive uh, things and in infrastructure you i don't put the warehouses here you can storage is container freight stations warehouse transportation hubs supply hubs and distribution centers and all that so this is also an asset intensive and you have lot of software packages available for uh, uh managing this uh, the for example wms is warehouse management system tms is transportation management system for trade facilitation is uh, in the in the ports uh, particularly gps global positioning systems rfid radio frequency identification so all these are the so software packages that are available and you have service providers who are three pls third party logistics players they are clearing agents who does this they are customs authorities they are trucking companies who supply the trucks and they are auditors and call centers now who are the people who basically uh, are the ones who are the bosses here that is the oems the four pls consultants software providers people who are providers and also the regulators so in other words if you if you look at 
uh, this particular diagram, it shows you that there are six layers of people. If you want, you can make more layers out of this, which are some of them are infrastructure, they provide the trucks and the storage software and service and their regulators. These are the ones. Now, in a country like India, what happens is you have no big players. In other words, it, if you want to move some uh, some material from another, there are only people who are truck owners who own one or two trucks or four or five trucks. There could be million of such, such uh, small players. Now, if you want to move some material from one place to the other, how do you do it in this splintered atmosphere? That is the problem that we are discussing here. In this splintered atmosphere with no scale and big industry push, the best model for Indian logistics is orchestration. So, each of these components layered above and below or either and communicates through more or less standard interfaces. How do these people communicate with each other? Is there any communication at all? If they communicate, it is standard by letters or by by uh, by phone or by fax and so or by post. So, how do you make things work in such a thing? An orchestrator can connect all the players to plan and execute logistics functions. So, it is important to realize. I'm I'm saying. I am not saying this kind of layered architecture for logistics is only in India. It is the layered architecture for uh, for logistics in any country. But how efficient of each in each and how efficient is the interconnection between them, communication between them, collaboration between them. So, an orchestrator can connect all the players to plan and execute the logistics functions. So, if you are sending uh, some uh, this one from one place to the other and you choose uh, 3PL uh, clearing agents and they will put it in some uh, warehouse and from there it will go to a port, from that port to another port here and from goes to this warehouse and through another clearing agent and it will go to uh, the particular owner, which whoever it is. So, if you if you go through uh, this whole thing, your product may go through several of these players like that. So, for that, you have to require an orchestrator to connect all the layer players and plan for this. So. For that, what is the business model that we have? It's like a similar diagram you have. You can have uh, here. For example, you have uh, a customer who has the orders to the logistics provider to transport from the supplier to the contract manufacturer to the customer. So let's look at what is the diagram here. So, there are once he receives the order, there is the operational status is found out, then there are the plans are given and the material actually flows through this and the payment is done. So, this suppliers to, to 2 PLs and so on, when we say this, there is in between here is the ports and warehouses and others and similarly in between are the ports and warehouses in all these places. So, your material actually moves from uh, the all the all the layers and this planning coordination and overall responsibility is being taken by lead logistics player or 4 PL. That is the kind of business model that uh, uh, that is followed and there are lots of companies in practice uh, which does uh, this kind of thing. But what happens is, what is the kind of this, you know, as I as I have shown, if you use cloud computing here, store all this information in a cloud and if everybody has access to the cloud in this and if you can use some machine learning techniques, then you can design, uh, uh, you can design algorithms which are, which makes this business 
a lot more. So, what is happening with all the advancements of advancement of these technologies in global supply chain is it is becoming more and more uh, technology intensive and uh, cloud computing and big data are entering into the logistics scenario. So, there is the finally the 4 PLs also do the execution. They provide the end to end B 2 B logistics services. They coordinate all the services needed for the good transfer like warehousing at the shipper and distributor ends, arrange for trucks all through the journey, manage the custom clearance at ports, loading and unloading cross docking merchant transit as required and manage all exceptions through a control room, truck failure, truck registration, payment at customs, driver schedules, expediting etcetera. So, if you uh, look at these functions of the execution, this is all what uh, the logistics provider, the fourth party logistics provider or LLP will do. And the LLP provides value added services to customers, supports or manages the production of multiple suppliers, coordinates their activities, assumes the responsibility for the logistics and the management of collaborative relations in the network and aligns the participants objectives with those of the complete chain. This is the point that is important that all the participants their objectives should be aligned along with the complete chain. So, everybody should feel responsible to uh, get the uh, things on time at the proper places. Uh, I think uh, uh, there is one example of this. Uh, there is a, a company called Penske in uh, uh, in the United States, and what Penske does is uh, it will lease vehicles from uh, companies like Toyota, Ford, and so on, and it will provide transport services. It will provide services, uh, trucking services, for auto components for uh, various manufacturers who are based out of Detroit. So, this is basically a United States operation. So, the components, the trucks move from uh, 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 some place, some city in the United States to, uh, uh, to basically Detroit. So, how do you, what Penske Logistics does one thing and that is the execution of this. There is a planning that it does and the planning depends on, on sophisticated MIP models, uh, integer programming models, but um, in addition it also does the execution. So, the BPV workers, BPO workers particularly from Genpac, uh, business process outsourcing workers in India and Mexico, they arrange for titles and registration of the trucks licensed by Genpac in the United States. In other words, they are basically Genpac, uh, the uh, trucks leased by, by Penske in the United States. Check the customer credit status, arrange for all necessary documents. If the truck gets stuck at a Y station failing to fulfill some permits, the truck driver would call an 800 number and the BPO staff transmits necessary documentation to the way station and the truck would be on the road within half an hour. So, what happens in all this is that there is continuous monitoring of uh, the truck travel by the BPO here. Now, you should understand one thing that there is not one truck from one place to another. There are several thousands of trucks which are traveling all over the United States and for Penske Logistics for example, in a during during a day, there could be several 1,000 trucks which are this one, which are ta taking goods from one place to the other in the United States, and that basically all the trucks have to be monitored and all exceptions are to be addressed. That's the point. 
So, this kind of thing if this supposing the if this facility of addressing is not available and if a truck fails it will remain on the road and the, it is up to the driver to get it ma ma repaired and then and then go ahead. So, basically the issue is that there is the company the Genpac uh, acts as an orchestrator on behalf of Penske Logistics or you can call Penske Logistics itself as an orchestrator which uses Genpac services to monitor the delivery of the auto components from all places in the United States to Detroit. So, after the trip driver's log will be shipped to Genpac facility in Mexico and where mileage tax, toll and fuel are punched into Penske computers and then processed in India. So, this is how um, uh, the execution takes place uh, this is a practical example of today. Genpac manages the logistics services of Penske such as just in time delivery of components to US factories and shipping final goods to retailers and home consumers. So, that is the uh, importance of uh, 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 the logistics uh, this one. So, let us look at um, uh, some two other uh, examples this and these examples are important because they have an Indian context. One is a Mundi which is an orchestrator in Indian agriculture markets. Now, there is a what is called APMC Act Agriculture uh, uh, Act which actually prohibits the farmers uh, directly selling to the retailers or the retailers directly procuring from the retailers. In other words, this is about our agriculture whether it is fruits, vegetables uh, and so on. So, the, the, the retailers in India cannot directly buy it from the farmers. I mean the uh, reason is that the government is worried that the farmers who are small farmers who are 2 acre, 2, 3 acre uh, owners, they may be uh, vandalized by the uh, the big players of the Mondays, the international players. So, for that reason the government has created a place called Mandi. that is an intermediary where the farmers go to the Mandi and then they sell their produce there and they basically the retailers come there and the transactions happen. So, what is the Mandi? Monday in India wholesale trade of agriculture products happens through Mondays. Trade outside is not permitted. Mondays are established under the Agriculture Product Marketing Committee Act, APMC Act to help small farmers get fair price and protect them from the traders. Governments have established 7000 Mondays in India. And uh, each Monday has a lot of real estate. These, uh, these, these are these are Mondays are there in big cities as well as in small cities. So uh, in big cities, there is huge space that is reserved for these Mondays. And farmers bring agriculture produce to Mondays, where it is auctioned and sold to traders or to commission agents. In classical open cry ascending price auction is the format used. In other words, the, the open cry in other words they, they all the players are there at one place and somebody manages uh, this one and each people shouting this one. It is an ascending auction that is if somebody says uh, some price then the next cry is going to be more than what it is and so on. The highest bidder gets the wins the vote. Traders later sell to wholesalers, retailers and companies. So, here if you if you look at this Monday market area, the, uh, the idea is that there are two problems associated with this. One is the Mondays are there 7000 Mondays, but India is a large country. So, all the farmers may not be able to bring the uh, their produce to the Monday. Although Mondays have very good facilities for stay and so on, overnight stay and all that, but still 
you know people have to haul their their goods over the time and the the second thing is that uh, uh, here the the warp and cry auction takes place and is it possible to do all this over internet that is the idea that is is and also Mondays is just a meeting place and the Mondays will not do is an orchestrator. So, what we are trying to look at here is can the Monday be an orchestrator. In other words, supposing there is a demand in the market for tomatoes or potatoes or whatever, is it possible for the Monday to tell the for potato farmers and ask them to get, get to the Monday these potatoes or something or as for example, there is a cotton requirement somewhere in, in Mumbai and is it is that information transmitted to the Mondays all over the country and the Mondays buy it and transmit it to the, the requirements and so, so basically there is a supply from the farmers and there is a demand what at the retailers at the factory level and so on depending on the commodity that we are talking about. Now, Mondays currently are acting as a place where you know it is a meeting place it's nothing else. So, can it become a more proactive orchestrator where it knows what are the what are the requirements of various players in the country and where they which farmers are producing this and connect both of them. So, that is the issue that, that we are talking. So, social network of the Monday here is the, you have a traditional Monday and you have uh, the players include there are the farmers, then these are the farmers and there are commission agents, you have the commission agents C's and uh, CS and industries, retailers, wholesalers, consumers and APMC Monday staff and so on. So, this becomes a big a social network not a not a big one for this, but if you take a particular product like coffee or, or, or rice or potatoes or, or onions, then you can probably get more focused uh, social network. And these are disparate groups with no ties. What is happening here is these farmers have no ties at all that they come to the traditional mine and this is only this is only the tie is in terms of just coming there and so on. There is no connection of our transactions that takes place. A structural holes exist between these communities. In other words, you have the farmers as a community and that is a network of themselves and there are the traders, there are the retailers and all that. That is another community and may this Monday only connecting point between them otherwise they are not connected. So, Monday basically is an orchestrator which fills the structural hole. What is a structural hole? Structural hole is between two communities if there is no communication then there is a hole there in terms of communication and an orchestrator is the one that fills uh, these particular kinds of holes and Monday is supposed to fill in the holes through interfaces, collaboration and so on. So, is the now here if you are doing the supply demand matching in other words whatever you know that cotton is needed in some place, you know cotton is produced by farmers in some, some other place, is it possible to connect both of them so that you have the so called supply demand matching that happens. And what is the farmers dilemma? The farmers dilemma is whether where and when to sell the produce, sell to the village trader or commission agent, sell to the village trader or commission agent or sell at the Monday. If you want to sell at the Monday, then you have to travel to the nearest Monday or another in city. Monday is far off, long wait for auction date and middleman interference and at the end it may not buy. So, you have a, a decision tree where you can you basically 
uh, can find out whether you want to sell depending on the probabilities uh, here. So, how do we analyze the met this one? Current agricultural network has structural holes. The farmers who are the sellers and the consumers, buyers are not allowed to buy sell directly with each other and are forced to transact via the mandi. Now, the trader monopoly exists. In the mandi system, traders have high bargaining power. Traders can form a cartel, a cartel and inhibit the ascending price auction from taking place. It is a usual problem and the supply demand mismatch. Farmers do not follow demand driven crop cultivation. Follow neighbors or past history and contract farming is not popular. So, for variety of reasons they said they were this one. And Monday is an electronic exchange, transform current Monday into an electronic marketplace and farmers can directly sell their produce online to the consumer, brokers, retailers breaking the monopoly of the middleman. So, why do you have to come and I mean the, in other words you can you can make Monday an electronic exchange and connect the to the farmers to this in order to have the physical exchange. The Monday exchange will also provide latest market price of all the crops and minimum support price and this is in a Monday does even that right now. Access to financial services provide real time weather seeds, fertilizers information and fills the structural holes by connecting farmers, quality control, transporters and consumers. So, if this is done now currently there is a Monday there is an infrastructure that is available. But the only thing is, is just used as a meeting place. So, I think it does not, it requires some effort to connect this Monday into an electronic exchange and where people can connect and it will the farmer, it will be the, uh, to the benefit of the farmers. The very big reason is the intermediaries are so powerful, the farmer usually gets only 20 percent of the final price the consumer pays. So, the consumer price say <coughs> 100 dollars, the farmer gets only 20 dollars 20 of that and there is a lot of food wastage and all that. So, lot of the yields of the agriculture supply chain can be treated using them by making the Monday an electronic exchange follows the path of Suffolk. There are some private players like Amun which does uh, in this and Suffolk and other cooperatives. The success of the Monday acts as an orchestrator and connects all the stakeholders in the agriculture supply chain, estimates the demand for each commodity and advises the farmers how many acres of cultivation is required for every year. Now, currently how do farmers produce whatever they are producing? They have produced this by whatever whatever neighbors are doing, whatever their grandfathers did. So they don't have any estimate of what is the market uh, need. Act as an enabler for farmers to become socially connected, and help farmers establish cooperatives like Amul and do value addition. So there is a lot uh, that if Monday now transforms itself as an orchestrator. There is a lot of benefit to the this one. So, what we are basically saying is that uh, you know in uh, 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 it is important people look at these governance models and uh, transform the currently operating enterprises until operating intermediaries or traders into orchestrators who are basically more useful. So, the I will very briefly look at uh, orchestrating a print supply chain. So, what is a print supply chain? Supposing you have a bank and the banks basically require a lot of uh, uh, printed ones. Supposing most of them uh, do online transactions, but if you want to you have to fill in if you want to take a loan, auto loan 
or a or a house loan then you have to fill in some forms get your signatures and so on and these forms have to be basically saved somewhere and these forms and similarly you have to send credit card statements you have to basically send uh, fill in the forms if you want to deposit a check with the raw cash and so on. So, there are several forms that are needed. And now, how are these forms printed in a, in a, in a, in a place like in, in India? These are basically if each, if a bank has 4,000, 5,000 branches and it costs like 4 to 500 crores per annum. So, basically these are all heavy, heavy items that uh, this one. What the bank typically does is the stationery department, it has uh, paper mills and ink and they bank all the stationery and warehouse it is in some place. And there are the print locations and this, this particularly the stationery that is needed could be forms, it could be envelopes, it could be uh, brochures, whatever is needed, but they need to be printed somewhere. And this is a, a small player phenomenon, but there are 5000 uh, branches. So, one thing is to print these brochures, these forms, these uh, loan application forms, uh, car loan application, house loan and the, the ink that is used is different because if it is house loan, it has to stay there for 40, 30 years, 40 years. And if it is car loan, it has to be, uh, it has to be stable for 10 to 15 years. So, basically there are quality issues that are, that are there and the branches are located all over India. The branches, bank branches are located all over India. So, these are all the bank branches that are there and whatever stationery is there, it has to be printed and it has to be sent to this one. Now, there could be, there could be some specialization or customization that may happen in the printing because India has 28 states and each state has a different language that speaks, native language. So, usually what the bank do is they have English on one side and the native language on the other side. So, there is a, depending on where the branch is, which state the branch is, it, it is basically, it may depend on that. So, there is some customization in terms of the printing that is needed. But all the content, everything has to be legal because, because it has to be permission and it, there is a central head, uh, headquarters that uh, decides all this. So, what is the problem here? The problem is that these branches require the stationery. One thing is they cannot, they can, they can have small printer and print it for, uh, uh, print, print that themselves and they do it that. But sometimes what the bank wants is, I mean they can supply the PDF files and they can print it and use that. But most banks have printed forms centrally printed and they are sent by courier to the bank branches. Imagine these bank branches are 5000 of them and so what, what you have is once the branches fill this, then some of this outbound sorting and bundling into pin codes and courier and distribution, finally part to the customers, partly to the headquarters branch and so on to the customer care. Supposing there is a house loan form that form has to go to the headquarters and any other forms have to be had to go and for example the credit card bills or the bank state account statements have to be mailed to the customers from the branches afterwards so if you look at the entire print supply chain there is the you take the white paper and then print it and send it to the branches customer fills in or uh, the bank branch fills in the account statements and then it goes back. So, there are several players who are in, who are there in this particular thing and we look at uh, this particular, this one because it costs, if you bank it is a huge expenditure. So, you can write down the ecosystem for this, but uh, we'll, because of time we'll, this one and you can orchestrate the, the entire 
this one that there is an orchestrator which usually it can be the bank, it can be somebody else and there is a print supplier, courier providers and it goes to the all the branches and so on. Now, whatever each branch requires is, is told to the printer, print service and so on and finally it goes back. So, you can have a, uh, a print supply chain governance model that uh, manages the entire thing. In other words, there is manager printers, manager courier services and bank branch interface, uh, you can, you can uh, have this. So, I mean the point here is this, there, why is there a need for an orchestrator? There is a need for an orchestrator because the banks are huge, it has several branches in various states and there is the print, this one that is required online is possible, but uh, it is not frequently used. So, and people require uh, this printing, uh, this one they have to use manually hand write and fill, fill these particular forms. So, that is where an orchestrator is needed to save uh, this one. Of course, this kind of uh, thing may be, uh, for example, as in the case of uh, uh, income tax filing, the government may say you can file uh, uh, if you have to do e-filing or something and uh, then those kind of uh, technology changes. Uh, may change this print supply chain, but currently the print supply chain needs an orchestrator to save a lot of money. Yes. Otherwise, uh, you know banks always, bank branches complain that they are not having the proper, uh, this one they have to use the Xerox, uh, the world forms and all that kind of thing. So, mapping the print supply chain, finding strategic printer partners and so on is an issue and the connections with stakeholders and interconnecting them through personal and business relationships are the soft skills that are needed. So, I think so far what we have been doing is I have given you several examples from airlines to contractors and particularly in the Indian context the, the print supply chain, the mandis and, and so on which are very important and people have to properly analyze these and, uh, and do the, uh, the appropriate analysis. And uh, one thing which, which is a very important topic is, I mean what is an orchestration? Orchestrator is basically he does not own anything, he just manages and there is a, uh, there is a, a possibility that most of these manufacturers become orchestrators because a manufacturer instead of doing everything himself, he outsources the manufacturing, he outsources the logistics, he outsources the distribution, everything and he just becomes a manager of this orchestration. So, are there any risks of this? In other words, when you outsource manufacturing, is there a risk of you are losing out something? You certainly lose the uh, intellectual property. As I uh, told you in the risks uh, chapter that uh, uh, there are lots of companies who became big by stealing the intellectual property. So, there is a risk of uh, this. So, is it possible to, to look at what are the risks here in this? Orchestration is a high risk model, there is no doubt about that. The orchestrating company mobilizes needed assets of other companies to support its own growth initiatives, right. So, once a company has chosen to orchestrate, it is difficult though not impossible to go back and reintegrate. What I am saying here is that if you are a manufacturing company, you just want to outsource everything, your manufacturing, design, everything and then you become an orchestrator. Then can you go back and reintegrate? No. But if you have started as a, as a uh, orchestrator, if you have started as a 4 PL and so on, is it possible for you to get into the manufacturing and all that? So, let us look at, here is the story of a company called Schwen, the iconic American bicycle manufacturer allowed to orchestrate to haul out its core. Let us look at this example. The story is this, 
Swan owned about 20 percent of US market. This is a bicycle market and produced hundreds of thousands of bikes a year in five factories. It was bicycle that all American children dreamed of owning and Swin stood for cutting edge innovation and unmatched quality, right. So that is the company that it has and its management felt that company's legacy of innovation and customer relationships were the most valuable assets and they outsourced production to a small supplier in Taiwan, Giant Manufacturing Corporation. So here comes the question of the core competency theory. Now, as I sh showed you last time, uh, infrastructure, customer relations and innovation, which are the ones that are important and people felt that innovation and customer relationships are the most valuable assets and the outsource production to a small supplier. That is the Giant Manufacturing Corporation. Schwinn did not ask for a stake in the Giant even as it handed over four-fifths of bicycle production to the partner, four-fifths, eighty percent. And the supplier gained knowledge and expertise cut costs to become a better bike maker than his partner. And Giant is now one of the world's largest bicycle companies. So what happened here? Your partner basically has the intellectual property. He made some improvements as he is doing the manufacturing. It is a low cost country and the Eastman lost its market share. So hollowing out. So orchestration can look very tempting and seductively easy. Let your partners do lot of the hard work while you sit back and reap the rewards. Right? that is the one that orchestration should not be misunderstood as. But there is substantial risk lurking behind this. Unused internal capabilities can quickly atrophy. If you do not use our capabilities, you may lose them and collaborators facilitating the process can get, the, get in the way. Partners may unexpectedly become competitors. So, when, when you are trying to manage something, then you know there are other people who want to get big also and there is competition everywhere. It's a, it's a, it is not unfair, it is a fair competition but like you everybody wants to make money. So you have to be careful when you just want to orchestrate. So what is the solution? In other words, we have been talking in these two lectures that orchestration is a good thing that is happening and uh, you know you can orchestrate and so on and all that. But there, we, if you look at the examples, uh, several examples, there are, there are several types of orchestration we have, uh, we have talked about and one kind of orchestration which is very highly risky is when you are a manufacturer, you outsource everything and try to manage then there is the risk of following it out. But if you are a service provider, for example a Mundi who is a service provider who is connecting people and it has a, a social purpose, then it could be an advantage. So but in the case of somebody who is following it out, what is the solution? Governance model, get involved in orchestration. In other words, I was carefully defining what is means in orchestration. It means connecting, it means setting up performance standards, it means execution. It just not mean just give it everything to everybody and then use it back and relax. So you are get involved in the orchestration. So basically knows people know you are asking people questions, so they know you are in the you are inside. Keep some production at home, call it high end. A lot of manufacturers are doing this particularly in the fashion business where they keep some production at home but they call it high end and rather run it as a joint venture. When you have a joint venture then you have your own people in that and you have a stake in it whether it is in foreign or whether it is in, whether, whether it is in your own country in some other country. Keep innovating 
and make the outsource model outdated and look for a new partner. So, it is not the strong ties kind of thing where you keep innovating and make the outsource model outdated and that means your partner whoever is doing things for you is outdated, but you are looking now for a new partner. The need for network architization can be seen most clearly in the failures of offshoring, outsourcing and strategic alliances. So, one thing that follows here we should understand that the orchestration we have projected is that as governance model for a dispersed manufacturer. In other words, for a social network of organizations which are globally dispersed. So, you are looking at orchestration as a governance model which basically connects all of them and puts them together towards a common goal. That is what it is. And but if you are basically a company and you want to uh, uh, outsource everything and then try to manage that is a misunderstanding of network organization, in which case you may get into the problems of, of the risk. So, so, what is the conclusion? What is that we have done in these two lectures? We have looked at orchestration as one of the governance models. So, in this governance models we looked at the orchestration defined it, what are the talents that are required, what is mere orchestration means and we looked at several, several examples and in particular in logistics, in supply chain as a Mundi, as a print supply chain which are small enterprises how orchestration can really help. So, in the examples I have given like the print supply chain or, or an agriculture Mundi or logistics you are basically a new player connecting with others, but there are examples like the hollowing out example of a manufacturer who outsources everything and he wants to just manage then there could be some risk. So, people should see what, what, what they are in and then implement orchestration understand it properly. The value of orchestration in manufacturing a service comes from integration, bridging borders as well as leveraging companies connections and knowledge across the network that is the important point. Modeling and analysis are in early stages, you know I, what I have presented here is all uh, is, is heuristics or you know kind of qualitative presentations of principles here which are important. Capability to connect competencies core competency of network orchestration is an important for specific capabilities you know. So, in other words a firm has a capabilities you are very good in design, you are good in manufacturing, you are good in uh, uh, in some, some services and so on, but like that you are good in connecting to good people that is also as good an important thing. And cloud, big data and other technological advantages will fuel orchestration as a popular model of governance. The future, the current things is that you have to communicate with your partners, how do you communicate? It's now, cloud computing and also big data analysis and the machine learning algorithms, they basically come into in a big way. Orchestration by NGOs and foundations to ensure food security, health, affordable housing and skill based education would benefit poorer sections of the population. So, this orchestration can be used for social uh, purposes where you have for example, health you can collect all the hospitals, the doctors and the patients and the security, uh, food security for example, you can connect all the players like the hawkers uh, and uh, uh, the NGOs and the, and the others to this and affordable housing and others. So, basically uh, that is where we stop and we will look at uh, some more things on the orchestration in the next class. Thank you.